Alright, so there is a video floating around, it's one month and a half old, something like that. It's called Reasonable Questions for Anti-SJWs. Now, I've been trying to get the time to actually make a response video, but the news cycle has been crazy. Now, thank goodness for the slower news days post-US elections that I can finally have a bit more time to allocate to making the kinds of videos that I like to make. So. Uh, without further ado, let's explore! Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Alright, so here's how things, uh, how this go is going to go. I will try my best to include all the questions and keep the answers sh short so the, over length of the overall length of the video be under 90 minutes. Now, this is my hope, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. But hey, I can strive for that, can't I? Alright, so play the clip. Yeah, about that. BuzzFeed is cancer. Even reasonable lefties, if I'm allowed to use such terminology, agree that BuzzFeed is cancer. Heck, even die-hard socialist Bernie fans agree that BuzzFeed is cancer. So, we're up for a good start. Oh, so you're making BuzzFeed great again? Okay, shoot! Are you able to understand the irony of responding to the perceived political correctness of the left with exasperated reactionary hypersensitivity of your own? Oh, I guess this doesn't apply to me, since I intentionally take my news almost exclusively from the left, precisely because I want to separate my less than gushing opinions about the left from what the left genuinely believes. This is why I routinely quote verbatim far-left websites like The Independent, Salon, Slate, Radfem Hub, The Guardian, Quartz Magazine, and so on and so forth. Also, <clears throat> point of information, reactionary is not something bad in and of itself. It's also not something good in and of itself. When my people rose against communist oppression in 1989, they were being reactionary. When the left throws a massive, continent-wide temper tantrum over the reality of President-elect Donald J. Trump, they are being reactionary. Reactionary means opposing a certain reform. Sometimes opposing a political reform is a good thing. Sometimes it isn't. Anyway, let's carry on, because there are a lot of questions. What is it with you people and skulls? I have to admit, I have no idea what you're talking about. I thought this was supposed to be the video with reasonable questions to anti-social justice warrior, where you open a dialogue. Now, was I wrong? How do you define right-wing? Anti-SJWs often have an aversion to being labeled as right-wing, yet they regularly defend the right and bash the left. Therefore, why is being labeled right-wing a bad thing to you? And if it's because right-wing is used as a pejorative, can you not see how labeling people as SJWs or regressives is also pejorative? Okay, so there is more than one question. First of all, I have no problem with being labeled right-wing. I am a right-wing libertarian and I have no urge to apologize to anyone for being a conservative libertarian. On the other hand, I think leftists owe me quite a lot of apology amongst other things, you know, for the whole communist oppression thingy. Now, how do I define right-wing? Well, the right-wing of the political spectrum is the collection of beliefs that emphasize the individual over the collective, that believes government has a certain legitimate function, narrowly limited by the confines of a constitution. 
The right wing of the political spectrum also tends to favor experience and or tradition over modernist hype because rightist thought tends to rely on precedent that is known to have worked when elaborating policy and by the same token to rely on precedent that is known not to have worked when opposing a certain policy. That would be the shortest definition that I can give. And yes, I can see how pa labeling people as SJWs can also be a pejorative, and I don't care. They don't care when they use my political and philosophical affiliation as a pejorative, why should I care when doing it to them, especially considering that the description is entirely accurate? I mean, facts don't care about your feelings, or about my feelings. Facts are facts. I am a right-winger, and you are a regressive social justice warrior. Alright, let's move on. I'm starting to enjoy this. Rather than telling people you disagree with to drink bleach, wouldn't it be more productive for you to have an actual conversation about the issues you feel matter? Or is it just easier to do the bleach thing? I actually do both. Though the go drink bleach thingy is not really my thing, I like to bathe in their tears a lot more. Besides, I don't want SJWs to die, nor do I want them silenced. Quite the opposite, the louder they shout, the more efficient they make the case for me that their beliefs are mental. When you go on TV to argue that biological sex doesn't exist, as an, SD, as an academic SJW just did in Canada, I don't have to say anything, I just have to quote your insanity verbatim. The case against social justice warriors builds itself at this point. All I have to do is poke you with a stick, metaphorically speaking of course, in case you go to sleep, so you, know, you can continue to talk. The more you talk, the more my side wins. Also, I did make at least one response video to an actual self-identified SJW, and she never bothered to respond. She came in, clicked the dislike button on the video without even watching 20 seconds of it, and then left. And mind you, the first minute of it was nice things about her. Anyway, let's go further. You claim to be proponents of rational, logical, evidence-based argumentation. That's great. That's entirely laudable. But when I look at your online activity, when I look at, I don't know, for example, your Twitter feed, that's often not what I see. How do you reconcile this claim to be evidence-based and rational and logical against stuff like, oh, I was just trolling you, oh, I was just shitposting, or TLDR? Now again, I don't think this applies to me that much. I make my shitposting very obvious. So obvious, in fact, that even SJWs figure it out. But then again, I don't backpedal on things. When I say that, for instance, generally over a lifetime only men pay taxes and thus women collectively feed off the men, thus making the modern state nothing more than a gigantic redistributionist scheme of resources from men to women, I actually mean it. I don't care if it hurts your feelings, nor do I care if you perceive that to be misogynistic. Facts don't care about your feelings. Same goes with any other controversial statement or position that I utter. I guess this question applies more to the anti-ASJWs who understand that social justice is bollocks, but still want to be part of the cool kids liberal club. Anyway, let's go on. No, seriously? What is it with you people and skulls? No, seriously, what the hell are you talking about? Are you aware that the ridiculous buzzwords you helped to popularize, like SJW and cuck and regressive, have all lost whatever meaning they once had, and only serve now as catch-all insults and pejoratives to derail any meaningful conversation? I will dare to presume that you and I have different definitions of what a meaningful conversation actually means. I don't consider a meaningful conversation to debate white privilege, for instance. It's a retarded idea with zero merit whatsoever in the real world. Same goes with many other popular themes in the tiny cult of social justice. Also, these terms were not meant to be insults, but rather descriptive. 
A regressive is one who, for instance, believes in feminism, the demented ideology spawned by a minuscule lesbianic cult that practices the faith that women are children. That's regressive, and it's not an insult, it's a description of reality. A social justice warrior is one who thinks is being oppressed in a Western country because the rest of the society doesn't kowtow to his or her preferred pronouns. That's an SJW. It's not an insult, it's a description of reality. Same goes with a cuck. A cuck is one who is extremely liberal on immigration, thus cucking his own people out of existence whilst claiming otherwise. Yes, it is an insult, but it is also a descriptive term. Even if it loses its uh, insulting capacity, it doesn't lose its descriptive capacity. Okay, this was actually a good question, so let's go to the next one. For the last time, what is it with you people and committing actual, literal felonies? Like, you might want to work on that? I mean, I thought the Ralph retort was so rational when he was fantasizing about beating up women with dyed hair, but then he assaulted a police officer and finally I was convinced. Now, I never got deep into the merits of uh, Rolf's case, so I have no idea about the whole picture there. But I will assume, for the sake of the argument, that uh, what this white blonde dude with an obsession on skulls is correct. Now, I know, I know, I'm taking a big leap of faith. But here's the thing. The anti-SJW crowd is not a homogeneous group by any means. Unlike SJWs, who agree with each other on everything, otherwise they're expelled from the SJW cult, the anti-SJW crowd is a very diverse coalition, ranging from disenfranchised leftists to right-wingers to anarcho-capitalists and almost anything you can imagine. And unlike SJWs, we don't actually police each other on purity. It's called diversity of opinions and ideas, a concept completely alien on the far left, but a concept widely embraced in, you know, the rest of the society. And the reason this coalition holds together, albeit loosely, is because each individual in this coalition has his or her own reasons for opposing you. For instance, Trannies like Blair White oppose you for ruining the tranny agenda and making it perpetually unpopular. Lefties like Sargon oppose you for ruining liberalism beyond recognition. Right-wingers like me oppose you because your policies are dangerous for the very future of our societies. Anarcho-capitalists oppose you because your bunch tends to be economically illiterate. And so on and so forth. So, you bringing up Rolf's case is rather pointless. It may help your case in a debate against Rolf, again, assuming that everything you said is true, but it doesn't help your case in a discussion with the wider anti-SJW coalition. Heck, many anti-SJWs don't even know who Rolf is. And they don't have to. Let's go further. In videos and in the comment sections, anti-feminists often take up the most extreme or the weakest feminist position they can find, or they just straight up misrepresent what the feminist position is. Instead, why not take up the strongest, most robust feminist argument you can find and really challenge yourself? Look, lady, I refuted to the point of obliteration one of the most important works in terms of feminist arguments. That would be Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex. And not only that, but I also demolished her character too, explaining in great, deal with, uh, in great detail with a huge list of citations why not only Simone de Beauvoir is wrong on politics, but why studying her is morally reprehensible in itself, since nobody would defend her had she been a man. Simone de Beauvoir was a Nazi, a pedophile, misogynist who systematically raped women alongside with her longtime lover, Jean-Paul Sartre. Links are in the low bar. Now, with that said, when it comes to comment sections, I usually tend to, <clears throat> well, work with the customer's material. So, if what I'm commenting on is not the most robust feminist argument, that's not really my fault, 
it's the fault of the original poster. More to the point, a movement is defined, at least in part, by its extremists and by its actions. Now, I personally choose to focus more on its actions because the actions of institutionalized feminism are damning enough and, at the end of the debate, there is no need for me to also bring up the huge pile of insanity that feminism and feminists have produced in terms of ideas. The founder of Planned Parenthood, for instance, was a Nazi eugenics-loving anti-Negro feminist. You know, that's just a fact. And Hillary Clinton looks up to her as a mentor. The National Organization for Women, the largest feminist organization on the planet, systematically opposed, and it still does so today, any effort to get any semblance of equity in the family court. Also, the feminists are responsible for ruining the careers of two of the most luminary scientists in the modern history of humanity, Matt Taylor and Tim Hunt. The actions of feminists are so damning that the case against feminism doesn't even have to include the examples of weak and or extreme feminist positions, such as the mainstream feminist Julie Bindel, who thinks all men should be locked into concentration camps. Okay, this was a decent question. Let's go further. I am deeply concerned with male addiction rates, suicide rates, and abuse rates, because I have worked with these issues in the quote-unquote real world. Would you be willing as anti-feminists to put aside your differences with feminists for the greater good of addressing these issues, especially as the kind of solutions needed are not necessarily gendered? And if so, I would actually like you to let me know, because I'm not fucking around or presenting any gotchas here. I actually really think that we could get something done if we work together. So, yeah. Okay, decent question. This one really comes down to the individual feminist. Would I be willing to work on any issue with a feminist like Julie Bindel? No, absolutely not, under no circumstances whatsoever. Would I be willing to work on suicide prevention with a feminist that's willing to keep the politics at the door and actually help depressed individuals, both men and women, and prevent even a few suicides from taking place? Yeah, sure. And this is not just a theoretical question for me. I actually did work once with, a <clears throat> with one in a project tackling male poverty. It was a success, so we tried again with another project that involved sex ed to rural areas. And it was a complete and utter failure. The point I'm trying to make here is that it really does come down to the individual and the issue at hand. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When it works, that's just fantastic. But when it doesn't, well, let's just say I'm not really surprised. Because the main difference is that most non-feminists don't see everything through the perspective of sexual politics. Sure, some do, but most don't. The reverse is true, however, with feminists. Most feminists view everything through the perspective of sexual politics, whilst a tiny minority understand where sexual politics ends and, well, where reality begins. But anyway, this was a fair and reasonable question. I guess this video isn't really that bad, after all, once we've gone over the skulls-obsessed chap. Let's move further. What is third-wave feminism? Because I've often heard you folks insist that you have no objection to feminism in general. It's specifically third wave feminism that you have a quarrel with. So what is third wave feminism specifically? And what specifically about third wave feminism do you have such a problem with? Okay, this question really isn't for me, because I have a problem with the entirety of feminism. Ever since the beginning, with the Declaration of Sentiments in Seneca Falls in 1848 and continuing through the Bolshevik Revolution and the rise of international feminism, led by Lenin's mistress, Inesa Armand, and continuing further into the terrorist suffragette movement in Britain, and then all the way through the so-called Second Wave, uh, which came uh, with political lesbianism and doubling down on the already pre-existent misandry, and then all the way till uh, the third wave Dumbler feminism, I think all of it is cancer. All of it. 
and my objections aren't even new by any means. Ernest Belfort Bax, a leftist by the way, laid out the groundwork of anti-feminism 103 years ago when he wrote the book The Fraud of Feminism, which I urge everyone to read since roughly 75% of it sounds like it was written yesterday. The inherent problems of feminism itself, regardless of its wave and incarnation and whatnot, have been present since the second the concept was born. Now, with that said, third wave Dumbler feminism comes with entirely new insanity, so much so that it enrages even older feminists. And this is something new in many ways. Previously, the, let's say, 1950s feminists didn't really disagree with the 1920s feminists. Similarly, the 1920s feminists didn't disagree with the 1880s feminists. There was a sort of an ideological continuum there in which it was assumed that the new feminists would build upon the insanity already existent and created by previous generations of feminists. This whole dynamic changed entirely with the emergence of Dumbler feminism, and while it is tempting to blame this on social media and the democratization of opinions, which brought a lot of nice things to humanity, but also a lot of insanity, well, like Dumbler feminism, but while it is tempting to lay the blame for this on social media, the blame for this lies at the feet of the sub-mediocre feminist ideologues who got affirmative action positions in the academe. And like many other sub-mediocre individuals, these individuals adopted what sounded good and then ran with it. And this coincided with the moment the new primitivism was also rising, the new primitivism being, of course, deconstructionalist postmodernism. This not only led to a clash between newer feminists, i.e. the third wave, and older feminists like Germaine Greer or Julie Bindel, this clash also revealed the inherent insanity of feminism even to people who are not obsessed with studying totalitarian ideologies like I am. One doesn't need 30,000 hours of studying totalitarianism or a degree in philosophy to notice that the overwhelming majority of third-wave feminist claims are simply bonkers. Let me give a few examples, a few specific examples. Uh, older feminists had started to drop the wage gap claim as many of them had finally realized that it was a bogus claim. New feminists made it great again. <laughs> they repopularized this mythology. The trouble is that in the age of the internet, debunking such mythology is remarkably easy. So as a result, even individuals who know nothing about the dirty history of this cancerous movement have started to see that something's rotten in the kingdom of Denmark. This led to a whole new generation of people who still believe some of the feminist mythologies, such as the absolute mythology that the first and second wave feminism was moral and legitimate. Seriously, kids, it wasn't. But they can see with their own eyes how cancerous third wave feminism is. So that's why you have so many anti-SGWs saying that they don't object to the entirety of feminism, but only to third wave feminism. They take that position because generally they don't know much about the previous ones, well, other than the official propaganda, that is. Anyway, this was actually a good question. Let's carry on. Why is it that this feminist <laughs> represents all feminists, but this men's rights activist doesn't represent all men's rights activists? Whoa, whoa, wait, sexism all the time? Ladies and men are different? So we're supposed to punch men and not hit ladies and open doors for men on your own, but not but ladies? Fuck you! Get out of my face, you tiny piece of shit! Now, do we have any evidence that that guy at the McDonald's even is an MRA? Serious question. You know, I looked up uh, MRA shouts at McDonald's and I, ha I, and I got the video, a claim on Reddit uh, to the tune of I bet this guy is a member or even a mod at the Red Pill subreddit and a blog post by David Futrell claiming the same thing. 
Now, whilst I generally dismiss David Futrell, largely because he's a pedophilia supporter who is being paid to be a hack for the institutionalized feminist establishment, I still went on and clicked. Even Futrell is unsure, and not even Futrell firmly asserts that that individual was an MRA. So, again, citation needed on the claim that that guy is an MRA. Also, point of information, the Red Pill subreddit is not an MRA subreddit. It never was. The easiest way to check that is to go there and see, well, how they speak about MRAs. On the other hand, we know for sure the trig that Triglipoff is a feminist. There is no doubt that she identifies as a feminist. None whatsoever. So, nice try, but no sale. Now, before going to the next question, it also needs to be said that nobody said Triglipoff represents all feminists. We just said that she is representative of campus feminists. And she is. Even her classmates believe that. So again, nice try. You know, SGWs have made questions to now be false. There used to be a time when slanted questions had a modicum of common sense. SGWs have made the 1980s media hacks to be angels of objectivity and civility in comparison. Anyway, next question. Why am I continually asked to answer for the views of feminists if I agree with feminism's overall aims, but don't agree much with those particular feminists? Does that mean that I can ask you to answer for anybody who labels themselves similarly to you, even if you don't agree much? Yes, please do. In fact, I answer to these kinds of questions all the time. Part of my audience is bewildered by the fact that I still do work with and for A Voice for Men. Part of my audience is bewildered that I rooted for Trump even though I didn't agree with a significant chunk of his platform. Part of my audience asks for my take on certain Zionists ever since I said publicly that I am a Zionist and I support the state of Israel just like I support the state of Poland or the state of Serbia. This is the real world, mate. Especially if you do political commentary, even if you do it as a hobby, you will always be asked about something said or done by the people on the quote-unquote your side. And yes, sometimes the people on your side do and say batshit crazy stuff because people are imperfect and yes, sometimes you have to go the extra mile and distance yourselves from these people. That's how this world of political commentary in a free and open market of ideas actually works. Now, I'm surprised that this question even exists. The fact that you're asking this shows how sheltered from the real world some social justice warriors are. When you put yourself and your opinions out there, there is feedback. And when you associate with a certain set of beliefs and principles, you have to be ready to face the feedback on that too. Everyone knows that. Well, everyone except for the social justice warriors, it would seem. Anyway, next question. If SGs are bad because they spend too much time whining and don't talk about real problems, then why aren't you talking about those problems instead of just whining about the other people over and over and over for literally years? I mean, in the scale of priorities, that's like even lower, right? You know, you've got the real problems, you've got the things that feminists worry about, and then you've got you going, oh, how, how dare they? Just how dare they have different priorities from me? Why can't they do what I do? Whine about whining forever for a living. That's healthy. Well, I guess this question is not for me, but I really think um, this question stems from ignorance in general. Yes, many professional anti-SGWs whine about whining quite a lot, but they also do support, both financially and with their own persona, quite a lot of practical causes. And this was true six weeks ago when this video was made, just as it is true today. Heck, most professional and non-professional anti-SGW pulled the lever for Trump. That's as practical as it, as it can get to a step to get rid of political correctness and the toxic influence of your ideology. 
Similarly, left-wing commentator Sargon Avakad had a campaign to pressure the British Brainwash Corporation into dropping its overtly sexist and racist hiring practices and policies. That's as practical as it can get. I donate to and shill for political campaigns and candidates that I like overtly to the detriment of things that I disagree with. I mean, what the hell do you expect? We lobby public institutions, we try to garner votes for our candidates, we lobby private institutions through the power of the wallet to get them to move away or to stay away from social justice. What else do you even expect? Conservatives are simply not revolutionaries, and you should thank your lucky stars that is the case. Now, I would like to see that change. I would like to see conservatives go actively go after you more proactively. And we're starting to do that, though not fast enough, if you're asking me. Anyway, can we get less of this guy? He's ruining the video. Most questions were good so far, but this guy really is a nuisance. Next question. Why don't you seem as concerned with actual feminist theory in academia as you are with wrecking people for views? I am concerned with the academia. Some of my best videos on feminism are about academic feminism, including interviews with an actual academic. Next question. Well, this was not really a question, but anyway. Since so many of you profess to be admirers of second wave feminism as opposed to third wave feminism, I thought it would be interesting to ask which second wave feminists in particular do you appreciate? Which books written by second wave feminists have you read and found interesting? Which second wave feminist activists have you specifically admired as you formed the opinion that you like second wave feminism but you have no use for third wave feminism? I'm just curious. Not a question for me, to be sure. Second wave feminism is cancer. All feminism is cancer. Next. You do understand that reading the title of a book or an article or watching the first 15 seconds of a video is not going to give you a deep, nuanced understanding of what that book or article or video is about, right? That being said, how can you expect to understand or critique feminist sources if you don't even attempt to understand what they're trying to say? This is getting repetitive. Again, I read more books on feminism than probably probably any of these schmucks in this video, and reviewed thoroughly some of them. The reverse is rarely true, though. Most SJWs have no idea who Milton Friedman was, yet they expect to discuss economic policy with me. Most SJWs have no idea who Thomas Sewell or Walter E. Williams are yet they expect to discuss institutionalized racism with me. So please, get off your high horse and lock yourself into a library for a few months, and then come back and let's chat. Next question. Why is trying and failing to debunk a study into sexual assault the number one priority for a rational thinker now? Doesn't it, does it maybe, maybe say something about your priorities? Does it maybe? Does it, nah, it's fine, it's fine, it's the feminazis, we have to stop them. They're taking away our video games. Look, Anita, I'm sorry, but we, we, I, I can't, we, we can't actually destroy video games, that doesn't make any sense. Seriously, this guy again? Considering how much the SJWs worked to put this video together, I was hoping they will have a more diverse, dare I say, set of both questions and speakers. Intersectional assault is utter nonsense. There's no meaningful scholarly substance to that, it's a purely ideological construct unrecognized and unusable in any meaningful social science. Heck, even some feminists admit that. See Christina Hoff Summers' book Who Stole Feminism on the issue of postmodernist gobbledygook infecting the movement. Next question. One of the major arguments that I see in many of your videos is that it is possible to separate criticism of the religion of Islam from the actual Muslim people. And yet, this line seems to be crossed very often. I see things like raghead or camel fucker or other things like that in your comment sections. I see people taking very serious shots at Muslims in videos and hangouts, and they don't get called out. 
at least not that I can see. So my question is this, why should a person of conscience who is concerned about the Muslim people and their community not being harmed or mistreated, why should they believe that you're actually only attempting to look at the ideas and talk about the ideas if you ignore bigotry that's occurring right in front of you? And in that light, would you be willing to break bread and salt with moderate Muslim people on your videos, have hangouts, invite them to your channels? Just just in order to build some bridges there and to learn more about what they think and how they feel and what their experience has been so that information and knowledge can be furthered. Okay, for the first part, the answer is, so what? I don't care if Muslims are offended. Being a Muslim is a choice. Choices have consequences. It is incumbent upon the individual to mitigate those consequences, not upon the rest of us to mitigate those consequences for them, unless we're talking violence, in which case, of course, the taxpayer-funded police should defend them of that. And no, I will never call out anyone mocking Muslims, no matter how insensitive they go about it. I don't care. On to the second part. With the person of conscience concerned about Muslims, again, uh, I don't care. I think being concerned about Muslims is insane in and of itself and morally equivalent to being concerned with the safety and the feelings of Nazis. With that said, why should such individuals believe that we're only attempting to look at the ideology first? Well, last time I checked, there isn't a systematic violent backlash against random Muslims anywhere outside, well, outside the Middle East, where Muslims kill other Muslims because they're the wrong kind of Muslim. So the facts simply don't bear that concern at all. And no, being poke fun at, at, at a McDonald's doesn't constitute a hate crime, nor is it being avoided on the street or anything of that sort. Freedom of association starts with the freedom not to associate. Now, on to the third part of the question, the answer is probably no. <clears throat> I, am not, I am a lot more interest, uh, interested to know um, what former Muslims have to say, because I really don't think I can learn anything from someone who believes the guy who married a six-year-old is a perfect man. That's literally what you have to believe even as a moderate Muslim. I'm sorry, I think that's sick. And I tend to avoid associating myself with people who have sick views. Besides, there is another, well, logistical problem. Most of the well-articulated liberal Muslims tend to be, well, assassinated by the real Muslims. Those that survive assassination attempts tend to become ex-Muslims quite fast. So, you see, even if I were eager to do this, I would still have, uh, I would still hit, well, a real-life problem. I also presume we have different definitions for what a moderate Muslim constitutes. Please do prove me wrong, but I think, I assume you think the militant Muslim mayor of London is a moderate. Well, I don't. Moderate Muslims, to me, are basically the Albanians and some of the Bosniaks who could reasonably be described as Muslims in name only. I'm very fine with those people. Also, the majority of Muslims are radical. I mean, there's pure research numbers on that, you can see for yourself. So finding that unicorn moderate is, well, difficult and not really worth the hassle. Next question. Do you deny that systemic racism against black people is like a thing in general? Yes, I do. The very idea of systemic or institutionalized racism existent in present-day Europe or North America is insane in and of itself. If so, what? Okay, just just step over. Just cover your ears for a second and let the smart people talk. That's a nice argument you have there, mate. And this is why social justice sucks. And this is why you guys will continue to lose from now on. You see, there's a whole new generation out there and a growing movement which is sick and tired of this kind of garbage. And doubling down on your cretinism ain't helping. If not, why is it so much more important to you to demonize groups like 
Black Lives Matter than to actually use your platforms to discuss actual solutions to issues surrounding race and racism. Black Lives Matter is a terrorist movement. Of course they should be demonized. I really hope President-elect Trump reverts to the Bush-era policy. We don't negotiate with terrorists. Next question. If you've ever discussed or done a video about black on black crime, when are you going to do a video about white on white crime and what we as white people can do to solve the problems in our community? Do you know what happens whenever anyone makes a video about white specific interests and solutions? You guys crawl out of the woodwork to scream racism, white supremism, or simply divert the conversation yet again for the gazillionth time to Negro-specific problems. Also, black on black and black on non-black crime is the majority of crime. If that one would be cut in half and nothing would be done about the white on white crime, the whole society would reach a whole new golden era of relative safety and crime-free zones. That's not racist, it's just mathematics. Also, most of the proposals that people like me put forth uh, for crime prevention are indeed race-blind. Namely, graduate college, get a job, <clears throat> and don't have kids before you have a stable marriage-like situation. Well, actually, I should say graduate high school, college is getting increasingly cancerous. But basically, single parenthood and the excessive downplay of education alongside with a vast decline in moral community standards are a significant driver of crime per se, and this is true both for blacks and for whites and for anyone, really. It's just that it's more obvious in the black community because illegitimacy and single parenthood are a lot more pre pervasive there, although whites are indeed catching up and that's bad news all around. As further evidence that what I'm saying is true, I will point you out to the so-called man deserts in England. These are all white people, same problems as the black ghettos in the States. Same goes in France, same goes in Italy, same goes in Bosnia, again, e even in all white communities. Next question. Why is a literal teenager's different definition of racism from you so horrifying that you all have to go, NO! NO! WE HAVE TO STOP HIM! WE'VE GOT TO DEBUNK HIM NOW! Ah! Oh god, this guy again! Well, the short answer is because that particular view has now infected several educational institutions. Guess what? We actually care what garbage is being poured into children's heads. Next question. Wherever did you get the idea that racism was a self-applied identity? I don't hold such an idea. And if the only true racists are the racists who self-identify as racists, how can we ever expect to make any social progress to reduce racism? Or did I just answer my own question? You what, mate? Racism is a word that has a clear definition. Nowhere does it say in the dictionary anything about self-identification. Now, with that said, I agree with Dr. Thomas Sewell on the issue of racism, namely that you can't actually fight racism because it's a feeling in people's heads, so the efforts ought to be concentrated on manifestations of racism that can legitimately be tackled within a free society, that is to say, without resorting to outright totalitarian measures that curb fundamental freedoms, such as the freedom of association. Next question. You often say that you are for equality of opportunity, but if people of color, for instance, have to overcome barriers whites do not, such as discrimination and unequal treatment as are well documented in various studies, then how can the current situation be thought of as equal opportunity in any real way? And why do you consider it racist to discuss these issues? Actually, I'm only for equality in the eyes of the law to the extent that is even possible. I reject any other notion of equality because any other notion of equality is unachievable and dangerous. Look, I had the exact same opportunities as Adrian Mutu to play football. It just so happens that there was a slight difference in 
well, innate skills that got him to play for Chelsea London and Juventus and me to play only fourth tier local leagues. Yes, I was treated differently because I sucked in comparison to him. My mom also had the exact same opportunities as Nadia Komanich to become an Olympic star. Well, they actually knew each other. It just so happens that my mom wasn't good at it at all, in addition to not being willing to put in the work necessary. The point I'm trying to make is that equality of opportunity means there are no legal barriers. That's really it. Then let the chips fall as they may. And yes, they will always fall unequally, and that is a good thing. Now, on to the second part of the question. You said people of color. Now, are Korean Americans people of color? Are Japanese Americans people of color? How about Indian Americans? Because it seems to me that they frequently end up higher than whites, and that's ab just absolutely fine. Aren't they facing up the issue of being treated diff differently? And if yes, then wouldn't it be a better idea for others to learn from their success and follow their example on how to deal with that? And if not, why not? You see, the main difference, the irreconcilable difference between us, is that we don't believe in identity politics. We just don't. We don't think an institution or a profession should reflect the demographics of the general population. We think it's okay that most runners are black and most hockey players are white. Also, you should be careful with the blanket, no nuances allowed condemnation of being treated differently. Sometimes that's very much needed. An example in this regard would be the drugs for cancer. The cancer mortality rate amongst blacks is higher than amongst whites, even when treated under exact same conditions with the exact same drugs and within the exact same time frame. Why? Because biology. <clears throat> but there's tremendous pushback to avoid studying this, because studying it would mean an implicit admission that blacks and whites are inherently, at a biological level, different. And even though such a vast study would save millions upon millions of black lives, it's being delayed purely for ideological reasons. So yeah, I will go there and say it. Your ideology kills people. You don't care about blacks, because if you had cared, you wouldn't have been pushing for the family-destroying, dependency-creating welfare policies that have disproportionately negatively affected the black population. You don't care about blacks, you just want to use them to bash white people who disagree with you. It's really that simple. Next question. Do you understand basic English syntax? Like, you know, if I say this cat is pretty, I don't mean that all other cats aren't pretty. Yes, I do. Your point, please. Like, do you really not get why saying all lives matter in response to Black Lives Matter is not only racially insensitive, but just patently ridiculous? First of all, I don't give two hoots if I am racially insensitive. Facts don't care about your feelings, as Ben Shapiro correctly likes to point out. Secondly, Black Lives Matter is a terrorist movement. All Lives Matter is the slogan to ideologically fight that said terrorist movement. It's not about syntax, it's about getting BLM out from legitimate discourse. BLM is cancer. Terroristic cancer. Next question, please. Isn't it offensive to men to assume that a man could only ever want equality for women and therefore be comfortable with feminism as a whole in order to get laid and that reduces us to beasts? If that was the case, wouldn't I attempt to get laid from my views instead of not ever trying that? I don't care what's offensive for you or for anyone. Your views are offensive to me, but you don't see me crying for shekels on Kickstarter for that. With that said, it is true that some men don't adhere to feminism just to get laid. It is indeed true that some men are just stupid. 
Science bears it out, just like there are more male geniuses than female geniuses, the corollary is also true. There are far more male idiots than there are female idiots. It's called the greater male va variability theory. Look it up, it's a very interesting topic. Besides, I don't personally assume that a man adhering to feminism is doing it to get laid, although I personally know a guy who does just that. We drink vodka from time to time and the guy donates to a voice for men and the honey badger brigade, yet if you look on his Facebook profile, you'll think he's a gender studies graduate. <laughs> But anyway, I do not assume that in general. In my experience, most people, both men and women, that seem to adhere to feminism do so for several reasons. They're ignorant about the details, they're honest to God collectivists, they're stupid, or they have a personality disorder. The ignorant crowd is the most numerous one, actually, which is why we do what we do, because ignorance is reversible. And it shows. The total number of people identifying as feminism as feminists is dwindling everywhere. And that's fantastic. Also, you gotta understand that the more the more skillful of us don't do it because we think we can convince you, the ideologues, that you are wrong. I am under no such impression. When I reply to SJWs, I do it in order to convince the audience that you are wrong. And that's how most anti-SJWs proceed, even if they don't overtly admit it or even if they did, didn't think about it this way to begin with. In practice, the result is the same. Next question, please. If you say you're an egalitarian, will you call out the man-hating slurs that you see coming from people within your community? People who use terms like cuck, beta male, faggot, or mangina? All of these things basically distill men down into thinking that the most important thing about them is to be having sex with a woman. That's rather offensive. So what are you doing to stop this kind of behavior in your community? I don't consider myself an egalitarian. Equality is a false god. There is no equality in nature. I am not equal to myself a year ago. Why would I be under the impression that I am equal to you? Or to anyone else, really? Considering so would be an extraordinary claim for which the required extraordinary evidence simply isn't there. Now, with that said, I already mentioned on the offensiveness issue. I don't care. I am offended every day, or rather, should I say, attempts to offend me are being made daily because they largely fail. Why do they fail? Because offense is never given, but always taken. The only term that I slightly have a problem with is mangina because it really doesn't capture the feeling that it was meant to transmit. Cuck is a lot more appropriate. But no, I don't call it out because I do not embrace the call-out culture. And it's a good thing. I had a very productive argument with an honest-to-God fascist. And whilst I was calling him a Nazi fag, a fucktarded totalitarian, and whilst he was calling me a kike-loving faggot and explaining how cucks like me should be gassed, we also exchanged quite a lot of good replies and links and data. I learned something new from that exchange, and he learned something new. We still hate each other, but we are both better off from that discussion. I would have missed that had I been into the call-out culture. Thank goodness I am not. Also, you might have noticed that, uh, that now even the mainstream media uses the word faggot when naming Milo Yiannopoulos' tour. Really, what you're asking is for us to be as thin-skinned as you are. Thanks, but no thanks. Next question. What is the number of followers, the number of likes, the number of dislikes, the number of retweets, the number of subscribers, any of those numbers, any of those metrics? What have they got to do with the argument? Deepak Chopra, for example, a man who trots out an endless stream of pseudoscientific quantum woo bollocks has nearly 3 million followers. So what? Those people follow him because he tells them what they want to hear. Why even mention the number of followers you have? 
What difference does it make? I actually agree with this point. Well, sort of. Yes, a good argument is a good argument regardless of how many people agree with it or how many people have seen it so far. There are only two instances when this matters, at least to me. One is when choosing to respond. I won't respond to an SJW with a thousand subscribers unless it's something so extraordinary that it is entirely worth it. The second instance where I do care is when responding to so-called mainstream journalists. When I encounter a salon writer or really any glorified activist bloggers who've hit the mainstream, yet their following is comparable with mine, that's when I am tempted to mention it. I don't always do it, but sometimes I do. Why? Because if you grant yourself so much importance, yet your following is comparable to an amateur, lousy conservative like me, then that says something about you. I don't pretend to be popular, nor do I aspire to be hugely popular. If it happens, that's great, but if it doesn't, that's also great. However, if one is in the mainstream, yet still easily comparable with me, then that says quite a lot about the mainstream. But yeah, I do agree with the substantive point of the question, namely that one's following shouldn't be the main counterpoint to one's argument. That's just really silly. See? I can even be charitable, as long as you don't give me that blonde guy again. You aren't going to do that, don't you? Next question, please. Why is it that you go on and fucking on about safe spaces and trigger warnings and delicate little flowers, but continue to hide behind your cartoon avatars and your childish pseudonyms, and whenever anyone calls you out on your sexist, racist, homophobic, bigoted rhetoric, you become the argument of your own scorn and are hashtag triggered, as they say. <clears throat> well, I don't hide behind the cartoon avatar, and my full name is easy to find, so is my home city. Now, with that said, I completely understand those who still remain anonymous. Although that is rapidly changing, as uh, your lot are finally having to withdraw, they're still a long way going, but the tides are indeed finally shifting. Slowly, but surely. Anyway, as I was saying, I completely understand those who choose to remain anonymous. You see, we don't try to use our societal leverage to get people fired. That's what I pitch now to my sides, namely that we absolutely should do that, because it should be absolutely shameful in and of itself to believe in social justice or to be a feminist. But for now, we aren't doing it. So it is completely safe to be an SJW even in an environment where most people are not. The reverse is not true, however. The preachers of tolerance and diversity, as it turns out, are the biggest enemies of tolerance and diversity of ideas. Companies are firing people for daring to vote for Donald Trump. People have been fired for trivial nonsense, such as retweeting a video or because an SJW lied about what they said. See the Tim Hunt saga for reference. People's careers are being ruined for wearing the wrong shirt. Academics are being punished for daring to criticize the safe spaces and trigger warnings. See the NYU professor's case for reference on that topic. In other words, amongst SJWs, it is literally dangerous not to be an SJW. So I fully understand why some choose to remain anonymous. I myself pondered for almost a year before starting this channel and only did so after taking the reasonable measures to ensure that I can't be touched by the online mob. But I do understand that most people cannot afford that, so they take the trade-off of semi-anonymity so they can still express themselves. Now, on to the safe spaces and trigger warnings. The safe space is a totalitarian construct. North Korea is a safe space. The very idea of a safe space is based on exclusion and marginalization to the benefit of the few. Now again, I don't necessarily have something against that. I do believe in voluntary segregation for any reason. However, that should occur on legitimately operated property or on your own property, and most definitely should not be extended to unwilling parties. 
So when you want to make an entire university a safe space, that's when we have a problem, especially if it's a taxpayer-funded university. Fully private ones can do as they please since private entities don't have to be inclusive. But public-funded universities must abide by a much more inclusive standard. Because if there is one student who does not want that, that student's unalienable right must prevail in front of the mob. It's an issue of consent, really. Okay, next question, we're almost done. Are you willing to publicly acknowledge and admonish the massive amount of hatred, bullying, harassment, and intimidation that a lot of your fans infringe upon people? And I don't mean these tiny disclaimers that you put under the description fold or flash for two seconds at the beginning of the video that you know nobody reads. I mean a public and ongoing anti-bullying stance. Or do you kind of like watching your fans go around harassing people and calling them slurs and telling them to kill themselves? You kind of like it, don't you? I mean, if that's your thing, I guess that's just what you're into. Just makes you a dick. I neither like it nor dislike it. I just simply don't care. It's called humility. You should try it. You see, I assume my fans are adults with their own agency and morality. I don't assume that I can control them. Also, I don't believe cyberbullying is real. I really don't. I think it's a non-issue that's been overinflated by the special snowflake and the increasingly histrionic far left. People disagreeing with you online is part and parcel of, well, being online. Being trolled is part and parcel of being online. That's never going to change. I was trolled and brigaded multiple times by leftists, by fascists, by alt-writers, again by leftists, and so on and so forth. What did I do? Well, nothing. I shrugged it off and moved on. It's called being an adult and acknowledging that you can't please everyone everywhere all the time. You should try it too. Next question. Why do you find it so hard to believe that feminists are being harassed online? Yes, I do. I don't believe your lot for a second. I will change my opinion when feminists will start routinely losing their jobs as a result of petitions and online brigading to their employers. I will change my opinion when feminists' websites will be under constant DDoS attacks, as many MRA websites were at some point. I will change my opinion when feminists will start having their home addresses published regularly, like three or four feminists per day. Basically, I will change my opinion when evidence will bear out the claim. Until then, the only evidence that I see is that someone called you mean words on Twitter or in the comments section. Sorry, Cupcake, that's not harassment. It's the internet. That's how it works for all of us. Learn how to deal with it. Of course, I don't expect you to actually do that because feminists tend to see any disagreement as hate. And as long as feminist stance on disagreement remains that, so will the exaggerated claims of harassment. Next question. Do you understand the key importance of reproducibility and repeatability in scientific research? That's simply going to Google Scholar, doing a 30 second search for keywords and pulling out the first paper you find that backs up your stance is not a particularly credible way to do research. That you have to have a much broader overview to read the material, to follow the citations through, to look at the broad brush approach to a particular problem. You do realise that you're as much of a social justice warrior as those you critique. It's just that you espouse a different form of social justice, a rather less considerate, rather less forgiving, rather less kind form of social justice. This really doesn't apply to me and the channel stands witness to that. Next question. If you identify as an egalitarian, then I'm interested in your take on the usefulness of the concept of the original position as laid out by John Rawls in his theory of justice. I don't identify as an egalitarian and the original position is not meant to be used. It's a thought experiment, a hypothetical situation. It assumes things that simply cannot be true in real life. Long story short, the original position is a utopian way of thinking, and utopianism is garbage. There are no solutions, only trade-offs. 
And the trade-off of having nations of laws instead of nations of men is proven to actually work to bring meaningful improvement with the consent of the governed. Rawls' utopia is... well, a utopia. Next question. As a supporter, as a proponent of freedom of speech, why do you want to quash academic freedom? If you're not familiar with the concept of academic freedom, it's worth, in the UK at least, looking up the 1988 Education Reform Act and seeing what that says about the rights of academics to put across unpopular opinions. You gotta be fucking kidding me, mate! <laughs> I mean, nobody on the S anti-SJW side is arguing for suppressing SJW professors. What we do argue is for a cease and desist on the practices of suppressing non-SJW professors and non-SJW voices in general. You said about the UK, okay, well, an academic debate between Julie Bindel and Milo Yiannopoulos was quashed by your side. Tim Hunt's career was quashed by your side. Professor Jordan B. Peterson is in big trouble for exercising his academic freedom and he is in trouble because of your side. So to argue that non-SJWs want to quash academic freedom and academics' right to put forth unpopular opinions is ridiculous in and of itself when the whole point of the anti-SJW pushback is precisely to support academics that have unpopular opinions. Amazing. Next question, please. Why are you so obsessed with Anita Sarkeesian? Well, I'm not. I think I made one or two videos in which I mentioned her briefly and zero videos on her specifically. Anyway, next and last question. Do you really think you can spend your entire life in a perpetual state of emotional immaturity? Do you actually imagine that you will be able to perpetuate your adolescence for your entire existence? Wait. Wait, didn't somebody else ask this one? Wait, I gotta... Ah, oh, fuck. Well, Sargon was right. Most of you do think like teenagers, and that's at best. Most of you are more ignorant than your average 10-year-old. Especially the subset of SGWs who think there are 30 genders. A 10-year-old already knows that's simply not true. So, your thug life attempt is not only lame, but also shows a deep lack of self-awareness on your behalf. <sighs> so yeah, this is the best the SGWs could do. I guess if I were to be mean, I would call them out on their lack of diversity, but I will try to refer refrain from doing that. Although it is interesting that whenever it comes to SGWs, it's almost an exclusive whites-only club and white men in particular. Now, unlike SJWs, I don't think that's wrong per se, but maybe, just maybe, this is happening because white men might have a much higher interest in politics on average than any other group. And as a result, most of the voices that end up being prominent also reflect the average interest in the topic in the general population. I mean, the same is true in the anti-Trump rallies. It's almost always 95-98% to 98 whites and 70% men claiming to speak for Hispanics, of which a third voted for Trump, or for blacks, of which 8-10% to 10 voted for Trump, or for women, of which 48% voted for Trump or other candidate. You guys will have to understand, whether you like it or not, that social justice is merely a minuscule cult at the fringes of the society, it doesn't represent the world, nor will it represent the world. The world is much more vast and, well, more diverse, especially intellectually diverse, than your tiny bubbles. And until you grasp that, you will continue to be consistently wrong and consistently asking largely the wrong questions. But anyway, I've had my fun doing this video and a few of those questions weren't really that bad, so overall, it's a win. I don't expect SGWs to watch this whole video, though I would be glad to be proven wrong, because unlike your average SGW, I always ask myself, what if I'm wrong? Not to mention that I routinely reach to conclusions that I want them to be wrong. That's humility, something which SGWs should try 
more often. Anyway, enough for now. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for your continuous support. And um, I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.